So every time I do a travel show, travel could be Brooklyn, in which case I use the Sherpa, I don't know Brooklyn, so I use Jordana Rothman, Daniel Krieger for a couple of shows I did. I get this idea to do Sicily. I've always wanted to go to Sicily. It's a flight, it's a long trip, it's a big investment. And I'm like, who do I know? Well, Melissa. I met Melissa at a restaurant in Chelsea, Iolo, one of the very few Sicilian restaurants in New York City. She's an academic turned chef who's been visiting Sicily regularly since she was a child and is writing a comprehensive book on Sicilian cuisine for Rizzoli. In short, she's an expert, knows the place, and knows the food. My idea is that you and I need to see outside of the main tourist areas, the unknown Sicily. The little spots, the crevices, the little mountain towns that are just undiscovered. We got a week, we're gonna kill it, 1,500 miles. Got a driver, got some Sherpas, let's do this thing. We're gonna have a great time, Mike, we're <laughs> excited. I'm Mike Colabecco, industry insider. Been in the business my whole life and I know what it takes to succeed. Each week we'll take you into real kitchens, filmed in real time. Backstage passes to a day in the life of chefs, restaurateurs, and their teams. The competition's fierce. Careers, life savings, and reputations hang in the balance. These are my people, and this is their passion. And that's what's next on Mike Colomeco's Real Food. Mike Colomeco's Real Food is brought to you by the continuous, generous support of the following underwriters. Extra virgin olive oil from Colavita, an Italian family brand. Rachel Ray's signature specialty food line, designed for preparing meals at home. Lou's Naturals Family of Brands offers all natural, minimally processed meats, free of antibiotics, hormones, and nitrites. From our family to yours. Imported from Italy, Anna Pasta is made from 100% Italian durum wheat semolina and pure spring water, slowly dried to cook al dente. Recipes online at cento.com. It's day one, it is so day one. We got picked up at the airport at six in the morning. JFK, direct to Palermo. We just got picked up and scooted to this place called La Foresteria. It's kind of a bed and breakfast winery, agro-tourism place, and we're already in love. We're looking at these rolling fields, the vineyards over here, the herb gardens here. Planeta is a big, well-known winery with vineyards all over Sicily, producing a lot of wine. And I've said a million times, the world did not need another drop of lightly oaked, international-style Chardonnay. But the one they make here from these vines is pretty darn good. Sicily is a great place for growing uh, happy vineyards because of the sun, because of the hills, because of the privileged position in the middle of the sea. Sicily has an interesting uh, geological history. And an active volcano. Actually, there is Etna, there is also Vulcano. Stromboli is still active, so there's more than one active <laughs> volcano. We'll head into the cellar to see the wine on barrique, on lees, and get a rare chance to witness batonnage firsthand. We use French oak barrique because we think they are very good quality. We have uh, Chardonnay grapes in here that have been crushed, in undergoing fermentation, and they're on the lees, which is that last bit of unfiltered yeah. sediment that has to be turned up all the time. It's going to naturally sink to the bottom, yeah. but through batonnage, through this instrument, he puts this in the barrique and twirls it. And if this was made out of glass, and I've actually seen barriques made out of glass for demo, what you'll see is that stirring up of yeah. the lees completely, yeah. making it cloudy. And that's what Chardonnay looks like when it's on the lees. Still, this is maybe 10 months. And then when you're finally done, when you have the wine where you want it, you'll filter it. This is Chardonnay 2013, 100% Chardonnay. The grapes come all from the Ulmo estate here around us. It does fermentation in the French oak barrique and stays in wood for about 10 months before going in the bottle. The idea was to make an, an international style Chardonnay. That's beautiful wine. It is a full-bodied white, but balanced. This is great. I mean, you feel the oak, you have the oak on the nose, but it's 
it's, it's integrated, which is something that that's the, the, white, the line that you walk that's the hard one. Now let's head into the kitchen and meet the chef, who will demo a famous Sicilian dish pairing fresh caught sardines with fennel and saffron. So walk me through this dish. You're gonna cook some pasta. Yeah, we cook some pasta. In the same time, we prepare the sauce. Yeah. Salted boiling water. Yeah. A good extra virgin, extra virgin olive oil. Pepper flakes. Some onions. Another important ingredient. Anchovy fillets. Is the anchovy. Add a little bit of water. From the pasta water. Chopped carrots. And of course, sardines. This is the perfect season for sardines. They have the right balance between fat, you know, and flesh. It's beautiful, beautiful. Okay, when sardines start to change the color, we add... A little bit of white wine. Clam juice. Sweat open clams, all that beautiful broth is full of flavor. Exactly. The most important ingredient as well in this season is the wild fennel. Yeah. Strong fennel. Really strong. Sauce is done now. We're gonna puree. Yeah. We add the saffron. Raisins and toasted pine nuts. Some lemon zest. Perfect melted. Now. And just top it with a little bit of these flash sauteed fresh sardines. The toasted breadcrumbs. Mm. Okay, they call it Sicilian Parmesan. Mm -hmm. Olive oil, beautiful. Buon appetito. With this kind of a recipe, where you find, you know, uh, uh, sweetness of carrots and fish, citrus flavor, lemon zest, Planeta Cometa is perfect. It smells great. It smells like Fiano. I mean, typically I know this wine from Campania. It's different. I've never had Fiano it's from different. Sicily. It's different. different soil, different, different. microclimates. Round, it's fatter, exactly. has a, a little more residual sugar than I think, but in a beautiful way. Tons of acidity and minerality on the back exactly. end. Exactly. All right, now let's get into this dish that everybody fights about, claiming that nobody makes it right unless they make it like my mother made it. <laughs> it's beautiful. Carrots add a little bit of sweetness to this. Fennel's everywhere, of course. The richness of Sicilian cuisine is you can go all around Sicily and eat the same recipe, but never eat the same, because every 10 kilometers change completely the rule. So nobody can say this is the best, this is the original one. Just enjoy. There is no such thing as Italian cuisine. Absolutely it is not. a fiefdom, it's a tribal place. Every little town has micro recipes. Maybe nowhere is that truer than this place. Basically how I see it is, I don't think there's such a thing as Sicilian cuisine. To me, it's, there's, a, there's Sicilian cuisines with an S on the end. There are pockets of Arborish people, originally of Albanian descent, scattered throughout Southern Italy. And here in Piana degli Albanese, this baker is part of that tradition. Or in San Giuseppe Iato. Basically, the inhabitants of the town are bilingual. They speak Arberesh, which is an older version of Albanian. It's not modern day Albanian. And they moved here during the end of the Byzantine Empire. And when the Ottoman Turks um, basically pushed them out, they were noble families that the Pope gave land in southern Italy to. Your traditional recipe, you're using as, as a fat in this. You're using lard. Yeah. And, and when you fry it, you fry it in lard. Exactly. We fry it in lard, and we use the lard inside. Everyone is famous for the canolo in this, in this town, or these group of towns, because they're filling the canolo to order. The right way to do it is eating a canolo that's been filled for 15 minutes, not one that's been sitting there. That's their tradition, and that's the only way it's done in this town. We're calling it canola. It's going to confuse Americans. Yeah. So cannoli is the plural of canolo. Canola. So this is technically a canolo. Sorry about that, all you Amer Americans that have been doing this wrong, myself included. There's a big mistake. It's adding the S especially. Cannolis. I want some cannolis. Mmm. <laughs> <No. laughs> it's like perfect. It's like crunchy, okay. it's not soggy, but then that you can actually taste as you're going through like this lingering dairy component. That's great cheese. Great cheese. Chef, thanks so much. Thank you to you.
Italians sure love their cheese, and I'm gonna get a chance to taste fresh, raw goat's milk from an ancient, almost extinct breed, and then taste the cheese made from it. We're still in Shaka, but on the outskirts in an area called La Chiana, which means the flatlands. And we are at a farm with a shepherd that raises Capre Girgentane, which translates to Girgentine goats, or the goats of Agrigento, which used to be called Girgenti. The goats have been here for uh, about a thousand years. We're gonna taste the difference between these two goat's milks. The common goat has definitely much more grassy smell to it. And the, the milk from the Girgenti goat is much more delicate. It almost, almost has the, uh, the scent of an almond milk. Common goat is the, uh, the brown one. Right, this one next. Okay, Girgenti This is almost like a neutral on the nose. This is sweeter to me, to me, I don't know. This is a little funkier, a little more herbal, a little more grassy. Yeah, you can see this turning into goat cheese and being recognized right away. This, not so much. This one is just made with the milk and rennet, but the rennet, instead of an animal's rennet, it's made with an artichoke rennet. So he's doing a lot of experimenting with making northern Italian cheeses, but only using the milk of the Girgenti goat. Yeah, I wouldn't know this was artichoke. It's a great tasting cheese, and, and the milk has just come through so clean mm. and fresh, right? I've never been a huge fan of limoncello, but today we'll meet a woman who makes small batch artisan limoncello from local organic lemons in what was once her garage. And you know what, folks? I really liked it. So the terms small batch and artisan are thrown around so much in the United States that they really don't mean anything. If I hear about one more Budweiser beer or Miller Lite or Coors that's small batch mountain brewed, I'm gonna puke. But yet there's some cool stuff going on in Brooklyn and Portland and all over the country with small batch stuff. That's a fact. Well, we're in this little tiny town at Monte Polizzo, this little factory, can I even call it that? Where they make a couple of things. Uh, their biggest product is limoncello. This woman's story is amazing. She started out real small. This is what she does every day, and I think the quantity is how many bottles a year? Uh, 100,000 bottles between the Amaro, a licorice liqueur, and the Limoncello. And remarkably, to this day, with 100,000 bottle production, everything's done by hand here. They finally got a bottling machine, but all the labeling's done by hand. All the seals are done by hand. And the alcohol is interesting. I mm -hmm. was thinking she was using just like a neutral grain spirit no. because so much of things are. And then much to my surprise, I find out that she's using... A molasses-based alcohol mm -hmm. because she says that the final product is much more smooth. So this is this alcohol made from molasses, which is what most rum is actually derived from. Then if you'll notice, before she puts these in, there's no none of the white stuff. This is really bitter. This is really aromatic, sweet, and full of the esters. By adding this, you end up with a bitter product. By not having that, which she doesn't have any, any pastry chef in New York would love that work. That's what's going in. Lid goes on. And then we're gonna see what comes out in two weeks time on the bottom. And after two weeks. That's what we have. The colors coming out of the skins. Yeah. It's infusing the flavor. But at this point, there's still no sweetener. And it's clear as opposed to the final product. So what we're gonna add here is this, which is not sweetened. And then they're gonna add the sweetener, which is really intense. And what ends up coming out is what's gonna come out the bottom there, which is the finished limoncello. May I? <laughs> you like it so much, I gotta go in there. This is gonna be just so rough, and I breathe fire, no, nobody light a match. Very tough. Woo! I know. <laughs> Thanks so much. Artisan, small batch, limoncello. I don't know how long that lasts in the Colomeco household. We'll, <laughs> we'll find out soon enough. So we're in the town of Salemi, Sicily, perched really high up on a hill. In fact, we're on the top of the town of Salemi in an old Norman fortress. This is, this is how they used to build these things. If you wanted to take this fortress, you had to get all the way to the top. We're here to go inside for a couple of women that own a restaurant in town, make incredible handmade pastas. I've seen this pasta before, busciate. Yeah, the busciate 
is traditional to the western side of Sicily. This is crazy how they're making it. So it's a fresh pasta, mm -hmm. they shape it down into these little logs, and then yes. the one sister turns that log into a longer, a little... thinner tube, mm -hmm. passes it on to the other sister, who rolls it around like basically like a chopstick. And what you end up with is this gorgeous little twirled, spiral mm -hmm. pasta that's hollow on the inside and that just catches all the sauce it in there. It does catch the sauce. I've heard of these fancy ritual breads throughout Sicily but had no idea what that's that meant. Kind of so let's find out. These are things that they would do for St. Joseph's Day, March 19th, and each loaf, they all get different symbols that correlate. The rose would go on the bread for Mother Mary. The bread for Joseph has little um, hammers because he was a woodworker. The jasmine flower is to represent the perfume of Jesus, so that goes on his bread. And every town has their own little kind of interpretation of this. Absolutely. There's a museum here in Salemi that uh, shows different breads from all over the island, and each town is different. Let's visit one of the birthplaces of sea salt off the coast of Marsala and then visit a local chef in town to see him make couscous by hand. So 2,700 years ago, the Greeks had one side of Sicily, the Carthaginians had the other, and they lived on that island. That was the staging ground. They first started harvesting sea salt right here in the lagoon of Stagnone. This lagoon's amazing. It feeds in from one side of the bay to the other. It's extremely shallow water. It's perfect for sea salting. They pump the salt with these windmills out of the lagoon into these little staging grounds where they let the water move in and out. And as the summer approached and the weather became ideal, this would slowly evaporate from the heat of the sun and the steady wind that you can hear on me to the point where in a two week period, this incredibly saline, briny mix actually became salt. This was the time when salt was worth its weight in gold. This is one of the birthplaces of sea salt and one of two places in Sicily most famous for it. I love this kind of stuff. If we were here in a month, we'd see sea salt being harvested. Do you think of couscous as a North African ingredient? You know, you see it in Morocco, Tangiers, Algeria. Well, couscous is really common here. Today we're gonna to do something I've never seen. We're gonna see couscous being made from scratch. And we should just mention this piece of wood that he's making it on. It's mulberry wood, specifically for this task. It's a hard wood that doesn't absorb water, so they can clean it. So you have to be able to feel with your fingers, he's saying, to see if it's wet to the right degree. Like so much of pasta making, right? Instead of forming a dough, you're forming little, little miniature doughs, basically, because that's what couscous is. It's just little tiny collections of, of the flour that, uh, that are held together by the water it's mixed with. Maybe that okay. So you get to a point where you start to feel the little ball balls form, but you have to make a decision at that point if you want to make them smaller or larger. Mm. He said he'll go for about 10 more minutes like this. All right, it's 10 minutes later and the, Melissa's See. in, she, she's on it. So it's actually collecting and it's forming its oh, own it's little universe. Oh, it's so much universe. fun. <laughs> on the western side of Sicily, around this Trapani Marsala area where it's made, it's made with fish as opposed to Meat, the lamb, North African chicken, idea. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We would let this sit for a few hours like this. It, it needs to feel like a dried pasta, mm -hmm. basically. Chef, grazie mille. Wow. Explain, my, my, my regret is we're not eating dinner tonight here. As the sun sets, we'll stop by the town of Castel Veltrano and meet Filippo Drago, a local Hot. baker working with Still ancient warm. organic bio grains. He's one of the rock stars of the right. slow foods Sicilian baking scene. <laughs> so we're at a bakery called Panificio Biologico. They use this ancient black grain that was almost extinct here that's now coming back in a big way. And the baker we're going to meet is the guy who's the reason he's been spirating this. He's got this biological flour, so it's bio-organic. He grinds it, he mills it, he buys it from farmers. This oven's really neat because it's a, it's a custom-built oven. And the fuel that he uses, and this is by Slow Food Rules, is nothing but... The olive branches. Olive branches. The olive. And there's, there's a bunch of rules around the bread. The mother yeast to this to go in. At least 20% of the tuminia, the ancient grain that has to be in the bread. Just to note, there's um, beers they're also doing, uh, pastas, a lot of pizzerias are using the ancient grains. So it's definitely not limited to bread making. So this is the pasta that we saw today that's rolled over those little narrow, whatever they are, reeds actually, called bouchate really typical of this region of Sicily, and this one's made of that ancient grain. Yeah. Actually, one time I tried this bread after it sat for two weeks, and it, it tasted like yesterday's bread. 
insanely good smelling bread. My first trip here was in 1980 and I was two years old. It was also my mother's first trip here, although she grew up speaking Sicilian dialect at home. And we came here and found a town full of cousins in the town where my grandmother was born. So every summer we came and I started speaking Italian. And what happened is, at it, by, by eight, nine years old, I was in love, you know, in love with the place, in love with all my friends here. And then at the end of the summer, I'd hide the passport because it's, you know, it's so hard to leave and just go back. Let's head up the mountain to the town of Calta Bellotta, where Melissa's mom and family hails from. And much of that family still live here today. You come up to this town that actually has history and a sense of place. A lot of history, prehistory, back to the Sicans who lived here before the ancient Greeks. The area itself was known for its fertility, called Triocola, before it was Calta Bellotta, which means in Arabic, fortress amongst the oak trees. So there's just layers and layers of history in this town. The mayor came out to meet us. Yeah. The town couldn't have been nicer. <laughs> we feel like we're honorary citizens mayor of this town. Paolo Segreto, well, he just <laughs> gave me honorary citizenship the other day. I was pretty lucky. There you go. So they've thrown a little bit of a spread up for us. We're going to yeah. go film. They brought up some local food. These are all typical items that are made throughout the year and for holidays in Calta Bellota. We have donuts here that are made with potatoes. So the potatoes cooked goes through the ricer and then made into a dough fl with flour and egg and fried, fried honey. This is called froscia, which is a savory Easter cake with ricotta, nepitedda, which is cadament, um, eggs and uh, breadcrumbs inside. The fava beans coming in season now in May. And then we have the semolina bread. That, that sandwich with the anchovies in it. They call it pane cunzato when it has the oil and the anchovies on top. And, and then that bread again. But this is in the style of Grandma's Town, Santana. It's not um, like the one we saw yesterday with the little flowers. That's much more intricate. Uh, here we have something called the giglio, the sfera, and the venison, which is cervo. This signifies the beginning of spring. Then, of course, the town's olives, which are biancolila olives. The um, olive oil that, that they make famous the, for. Very famous for. This is... This is a olive oil town. Okay. Obviously, we're here in the spring. It's fava season. Italians adore fava beans, and so do so many American chefs now. But there's so much work going in here. They're not just shucking the favas out of the long shell, but they're also taking that little waxy outer shell, which a lot of places don't do, to give us this perfect, the, just the inside nugget, which is the sweetest. It's not starchy. I mean, you could eat these raw all day long. Well, fava beans are interesting because throughout history in Sicily, they've actually taken on many different roles. Uh, for example, in ancient Greece, they were considered an aphrodisiac by some. Others actually considered them uh, like a poison, uh, only food of the dead. Today, they're considered like the, basically the bread of the poor, il pane dei poveri. Uh, they're a very simple, inexpensive food. We actually think of them as more expensive because they are for us. Right. In the restaurants, right. for example, they're an expensive ingredient. Over this wood stove, she's got a lot of olive oil, some garlic, a bunch of onion that she started earlier, raw fava beans that we just picked, just shucked, just peeled, and this is just fresh parsley from the garden. And she's using stems and all. Stems have flavor, whatever, this is wild parsley. We're not looking for three-star reviews from the Times, we're in the country house now. You know what, this is real, real yeah. good food. Yeah. Real food. Hey, that's the name of the show, I think. Yeah. Mm. And look at the color of that water then. She put it in with the, with the we were sauteing the favas, and it's green and full of chlorophyll from the parsley and the beans already. Like a vegetable broth. And now they've added what they call pasta shoot, dry pasta, broken dry spaghetti, and rice. And by cooking the spaghetti and the rice with the fava beans and the water, that starch has actually acted as a lie and it's thickened it. So for me, for my style of cooking, peasant food paradise. This is how I cook at home on a good day. The quietest and the stillest I've seen her. <laughs> That's it, only eating. So I walked out to those trees. Yeah. Tell me about this variety of orange. What are they? They're called Washington Naval, which is an American variety. In the US. 
first introduced here in late 70s. My family's been doing pretty much only this variety for the last 30 years. So olive orchards, lemons, oranges, on organic garden. All organic, yeah. With fava, everything else growing back there. And this is the country home, this is like paradise. Yeah, but they have everything depending on the time of year. They do the eggplants, the tomatoes, they bottle 500 bottles a year of their own tomato sauce. Yeah, it's a great place. <sighs> this meal has to come to an end, so we're going to have to invite everybody. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, folks. Ciao, tutti. Grazie. Thank you so much. <laughs> Grazie, Maria. Grazie mille. Grazie. Okay. <laughs> I could have stayed at that picnic table in the countryside all day long, but we had work to do and a second show to shoot. So stay tuned next week for Sicily, Volume 2. <laughs> Mike Colomeco's Real Food is brought to you by the continuous, generous support of the following underwriters. Extra virgin olive oil from Colavita, an Italian family brand. Rachel Ray's signature specialty food line, designed for preparing meals at home. Lou's Naturals Family of Brands offers all-natural, minimally processed meats, free of antibiotics, hormones, and nitrites, from our family to yours. Imported from Italy, Anna Pasta is made from 100% Italian durum wheat semolina and pure spring water, slowly dried to cook al dente. Recipes online at cento.com.